This is How to Cut It in the Hairdressing Industry Podcast with Dom Lahane, episode number one. Welcome to How to Cut It in the Hairdressing Industry Podcast. The show that gives you the insights, inspirations and information to take your hairdressing and barbering careers to the next level. And here's your host, Dom Lahane. So welcome and thank you for joining us to today, our very first of How to Cut It in the Hairdressing Industry podcast with myself, Dom Lahane. So what can you expect in today's show? Well, this is going to be a solo show where it's just myself, the microphone and you. And really, I want to firstly give you a heads up on what you can expect from How to Cut It going forward in the the coming weeks, months and hopefully years. But also, I'd like to have the opportunity as your weekly host to get to introduce myself to you so you understand me, my journey in hairdressing and currently where I'm at right now. But first up, how to cut it in the hairdressing industry podcast. What the heck is this all about? Well, firstly, why a podcast? Well, podcasts were something that I discovered way back in probably summer of 2013. Never listened to them before. But it was at that moment I was on holiday and and I looked on my smartphone and and there was that little sort of purple thumbnail said podcast. And, you know, I was going to lounge in the sun, sat down, clicked on it, and it opened me up to a whole world of information and entertainment. And I just loved it. And I remember for that holiday, I was just switched on completely to podcasts. And from that moment on, I've loved them ever since. And, And probably a big reason to why I love them is... You can listen and, and still carry on with the jobs that are going on around you, you know, so whether you're you're mowing the lawn or you're driving in your car, in the gym, on the train, wherever you may be, you can always listen into a podcast, but still going about your everyday life where, you know, in the world of videos, streaming, love them, big fan of them. But you have to stop. You have to give your time to watch what's going on. So podcasts for me work really, really well. And I love that resource that you can get from audio content. So that was really the first reason why I discovered podcasts and my interest for them come. But being massively passionate about hairdressing and the industry that we're in, I then started to search out for, you know, relative subjects in hairdressing. And, and there were shows out there, but there wasn't anything that was reaching out to me that think that grabbed me and what I was looking for, the kind of guests that I was looking for. So that's when my journey into bringing a podcast to what you're now hearing to uh, began. You know, it's taken me a good year and a half of planning and researching and, and learning the whole subject. It, it was, I don't claim it's uh, rocket science. It, there, there is certainly stuff to it that you've got to understand. And here we are. So welcome to that podcast. Now, going forward, what are we going to be bringing you? Well, most of all, we're going to be bringing you some amazing guests. So each week, I'm going to invite a guest onto the show. But also, I'm looking to invite guests from outside the hairdressing industry that are that are maybe going to bring their sort of industry sector uh, into the hairdressing. And something that we can take from there, because I always think having a different spin on things can certainly give us some great ideas. So we're going to invite a cross-section of guests there will be some solo shows from myself where you know whether i've been to a trade show or just things going on in the hairdressing industry at large you know we'll have them shows as well so my aim and my goal is that i aim to bring these at least every two weeks and maybe hopefully every week going forward and uh, yeah we're going to bring you some amazing content from that so in terms of of the guests you know it, it will be a case of me mostly from my studio where I'm based, but also there'll be times where I'm going out to their their particular environment or maybe at a trade show or just out and about an event. So that's where we'll be conducting our interviews. Now, the one thing that I do stress is that I don't plan to over-edit these shows. Now, again, I don't claim to be a podcast expert at this moment of time in recording. It is a new journey for me, something that I'm really excited about. But there will be errors and I'm going to be learning and I'm sure I'm going to listen to this in years to come. Oh, my goodness, did I really say that? So I am going to be learning. And, you know, along the way, as you make mistakes, there's going to be errors in our shows. I I make no lie about that. But what I don't want to do is over edit because I think it's important that you you get the realness, the rawness of live interviews. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes we can over polish and take things out that don't need to be. So about how to cut it, what is that all about? 
Well, it's a resource for starters. And you've heard in our uh, jingle at the start, uh, you'll hear that um, the words insights, inspiration and information. And that really sort of says what this show is all about. It's about the hairdressing and barbering industry. So if you're maybe a, a somebody coming out of school looking for a career into the industry of hair, or you're maybe looking for a career change into the hairdressing industry, or maybe you're a hairdresser who's just looking for a new direction to go in. This is that show. So when we say insights, this is where our guests and myself will be giving you the insiders of eyes, the, the guys, you know, the, 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 the insights to the stories, to their journey. And then we're going to have the inspirations. And the inspirations is all about you getting inspired from what you hear from our guests. And hopefully those inspirations are going to take you on to new places within the hairdressing industry and actually open your eye to what's available to you. And then you'll hear the word information. As it says, that is your resource. And what is important and the most important part for us all in this show is that you get lots of information, helpful information. And that information will be something that is going to set you off in your hairdressing career and it's going to give you them challenges. And anything that we talked about, you're always going to find that information within these sort of podcast notes. So that's what you need to remember. Insights, inspiration and information to take your hairdressing and barbering careers to the very next level. So that is how to cut it in the hairdressing industry podcast. This is where we start. I'm sure we're going to grow and we're going to, as time goes on, we're going to introduce new things, new directions. And it's a really exciting time. I'm, I'm so buzzing about it. So I want to give you a, a sort of an overview to me and my hairdressing career so far to date. Well, uh, I'm currently celebrating my 30th year in hairdressing so this is the year 2017 so my 30th year from school still very much a working hairdresser uh, I'm a salon owner I own a very small boutique salon in a rural village in Northamptonshire in the United Kingdom which is right in the heart of England if uh, you're from overseas wondering where that is so still very much on the floor working on that but my journey into the hairdressing industry didn't just sort of you know it wasn't saying I was going through school thinking you know what I want to be a hairdresser I'm a I'm from a full I'm a fourth generation hairdresser in my family my mum was a hairdresser salon owner and still to this day is uh, doing hair on her long-serving clients my nan was a hairdresser and my great nan was a hairdresser and a salon owner who had two salons in London so I was brought up around hairdressing, but it it wasn't something that um, I was going through my life, you know, from being a kid to a, a young teenager thinking that's what I want to do. You know, my early experiences of hair was my mum, you know, doing her mobile rounds and, you know, going and doing her regular clientels. Not the most glamorous of uh, clientels. I'm sure she won't mind me saying that. You know, and that was a lot of blow dries, a lot of sets. But she earned a very good living. And as a child growing up, hairdressing really provided us with a great lifestyle. And, I, you know, I always owe that to this industry. And I think that's partly why I want to give so much back because of what it can give, what it's given to me and my family going um, over the years going forward. But uh, really, you know, I say I was getting older, I was sort of coming towards my teens, 13. And the first time that the hairdressing really came onto my radar was we were at some friend's uh, house and that typical conversation with friends, you know, what would you like to do, Dom, when you leave school? And, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I, I was kind of going through school, you know, probably like so many of, uh, of the school children thinking, I haven't a clue. And, and they said, had you ever considered going into hairdressing? And my, my instant reaction to that was no. Anyway, we're driving home and, and the idea kind of started to register. I was thinking, maybe, you know, why haven't I looked into it? So being me, you know, if I, I get suddenly interested in saying, I go and research it. And the following morning, I, I pick up some of my mum's hairdressers journals, always subscribe to that. And that was my first real insight into the hairdressing industry and what goes on. And, and it really excited me. And then in 1984, I believe it was, my mum again was going off to Salon International, which was at Earl's Court at this time. And this was the first time that I've been to a Salon International. Uh, haven't missed one since, only one, I think, in, in all those years. But I went and it blew me away. That was it. 
I was just hooked on hairdressing. I think the whole energy of the place, the the work going on the stage, suddenly there was all these craftspeople cutting hair beautifully and artists sort of styling up do's. It, it was just incredibly exciting. And, and you know, my mum had a salon at this time and, you know, my experiences of hairdressing was just her local salon, rows and rows of hooded dryers down the middle. So suddenly seeing this world of hairdressing, that was it. I, I didn't want to do anything else from that day on in 1984. And, and I got hooked and everything from that moment... Yeah, everything. I just researched hair. I was reading about hair, and 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 I remember again at this time it was quite an exciting time for hairdressing. If I remember, right. I think the British Hairdressing Awards was just starting, and um, there was a TV program on at the time called Clothes Show, and and that was all about fashion and 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 how hair linked into that fashion. It really opened my eyes to it. But there was another little changing point in my career, and there was a program on BBC TV at this time, and it was called Hair, hosted by Trevor Sorby. And this was the first time that Trevor Sorby ever came onto my radar. So I think this was probably 85, if I remember rightly. And and Trevor invited guests onto his show. And they, they talked about hair and they'd done hair and they'd done haircuts and perms. And it really bizarre. You wouldn't imagine that kind of program on TV now. But back then it was brilliant. So if anybody remembers that, do get in touch and let me know. Because I feel like I was the only ever person to ever see that show. But uh, yeah, it, it changed my direction on where I wanted to go. So from that moment, Trevor Sorby was where I wanted to go and work. I hadn't researched too much more other than, yeah, I want to work at Trevor Sorby, who was down in London. Apply for a job, got the job, and I left school in 1986, 16, and in, I think it was July of that year, I headed off and moved to London as a 16-year-old, stayed with friends of the family, and began life. And the, the, the salon, uh, Trevor Sorby, was in Russell Street, I believe, in Covent Garden, which was just just up from the piazza and in, in between, and the Royal Opera House was the other, and it was so exciting. This salon was just the hub of creativity fashion amazing hairdressers and you could already see and trevor i think had just recently won the first british hairdressing of the year awards i'm I'm sure was about 85 the year before but again i stand corrected so if i have got that wrong do leave a comment at the end of this show uh just give it correct to me uh if i've got that one right um so yeah, so we started there and, and at this time Eugene Solomon was working in a salon as a stylist and I think he was the artistic director and I had the pleasure to be his trainee at this period in in, in my career and, and just standing by Eugene, this is long before he's gone off and done his session work but you could see that that bloke was an incredible hair, hairdresser, he, his love for the industry and his vision was second to none and, and in the staff room, I always remember I used to go down there and there was this sort of product room and, and there was all these kind of foamed mannequin heads that, that had Eugene's uh, avant-garde creations on there. And I, he was the first real hair hero of mine after Trevor Sorby, of course. And But he was an amazing guy as well. Very, very humble, very, very helpful. So I really had that pleasure to stand and, and work alongside him. But working at Trevor Sorby at this time... Yeah, I was missing home. I make no lie about it. A lot of my friends were gone on to sixth form at school and were beginning to go out and party. And I was travelling back and forth from London to my home in Northampton, which is about 50 miles away from London, and getting a train back. And after around about eight months, I, I decided it was time probably for me to go back home. I was missing home. There was some difficulties going on in the house that I was living in at the time in London, which probably decided my decision. So I, 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 one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to do, but I, I decided to come away and I, I went back to my mum's salon and it was quite an extreme to make the, make no lies of it. I was going from the Trevor Sorby salon to working in my mum's salon, which believe me was a local hairdressers. I mean, and when I say neck curtains, it had the neck curtains up there and yeah, but it was a successful business. She took it from being a really run down, quiet business to being a buzzing local shop. And we used to get all the ladies from the villages and, you know, ladies of the manor. But this was a time of, what, 87, I believe it was. And, you know, shampoos and sets and weekly blow dries were a big business of hair and perms. So I worked there for a while and, and I learned a lot. I've got to say, and... You, you know, I think when you talk to any hairdresser, I think anybody that's worked in sometimes maybe not the most glamorous salons, you learn so much. You learn the realness of hairdressing. 
And I did. So I carried on there. And I believe in sort of late 87, a job came up in, in Northampton Town Centre. And it was looking for trainees. And, and they were paying £100. I kind of thought, £100? I've been earning 33 quid on the YTS. So I applied for it. And, and I joined this salon in town. And it was a beautiful salon. And, you know, they, they'd gone out and recruited some of the biggest names in the area of where I lived. But one guy, again, another real inspiration to my career was uh, the artistic director they got there. And his name was Clive Allwright. And Clive had been working in Tony and Guy in Sloan Square. So we've got to remember, this is 1987. Tony and Guy was starting to become huge. And, you know, I was, again, always, always excited by Tony and Guy and Anthony Muscalo and his work. And I think that came from Salon International and always buying their DVDs. And I loved the way they cut and the fashion approach to hair. So having Clive working at this salon, being at Tony and Guy and bringing that Tony and Guy style with him so excited me. And I I, I loved the, the way that he cut hair. So he was a big inspiration of mine. And I had a great time. I was working with some great people, you know, socialising, all of similar ages. And we continued there. And then it, it was around about 89, I think a job then came up for... Uh, looking for hairstylists again this was in the hairdresser journal always my bible at this time for looking jobs i used to go to the back of their magazine and there would be the jobs yeah they were looking for some hairdressers that would would work in presenting these new hair products and it was garnier who were i i believe again quite new 1988 89 time they were, they were newly launched and they were launching this product range called garnet um, graphic sorry and and this was a styling range, and I went for it, and I got the job. It was, um, yeah, an incredible job for me. We we toured around the UK in sort of big shoot, uh, shopping centres, supermarkets, and, and the idea of that job was I got on stage and done the hair. We're using the products on the general public, and obviously it really promoted the uh, their, their range well. Uh, I think there's a little tip there for any brands out there. Really good concept. Get out and get into these supermarkets where you're selling your products. Get a little stage. It really worked well. But it was great. We travelled around the country four days a week doing that. Uh, there was always sort of there was there must have been about ten teams. I think they had in all in all going out there. So I was working with PR girls and yeah, very exciting for a 19 year old lad. So then the next big break on the back of that came for me, which was. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, the clothes show. The clothes show at this time was huge. And they had what they called clothes show model of the year. And everybody in the UK knew of this competition. If you were an aspiring model, this was the competition that you wanted to win. And Garnier sponsored this uh, this model of the year competition. And, and, and I was selected to be that hairdresser, the hairdresser who was going to go out style the hair of the models and style the general public's hair and they and we rocked up into cities around the uk but right into the 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 center of these shopping centers and i'm talking a massive shopping centers and the setup was huge they had big catwalks and and there would be styling chairs and it was just fantastic for for a young 19 year old lad doing this kind of concept and working on these events were brilliant and learned so much for that and we continued and then that then came to an end and then I was looking for my next direction and, and there was a job for a leading hair manufacturer and they were again launching a, a new product range and this was around about the, I think we're probably going to, what, 2001 time, 2001, yeah. And anyway, they were launching a product range and, and they were looking for a technician, somebody who would go out, talk to the the the, the salons uh, about hair product, about these range of products that they bought, and and show them how to use it and so forth. And I got that job, and again, really really good times. It was exciting. I was going around the country, you know, twenty one. 22 years of age, um, and talking to salons and giving them education in products. But I think there was always that part of me where I was thinking, I think I want to get back into the salon. The, the salon life is something that I've always, always enjoyed. And that buzz of being part of a salon team. And so I started looking into it and I, and I spoke to my family and, you know, I was starting to say, yeah, I'd, I'd love the opportunity to get into having my own salon. You know, I had a little bit of savings there. And, and I spoke to 
uh, my mum, and she was like, well, have you ever considered coming into the business with me? And I'd be delighted to have you as a partner. And it wasn't really what I was looking for. I, you know, I'm, I'm still what, 22 at this time, coming up to 23. I'm, I wanted to be in the heart of, you know, the city centre where my mum's salon was, you know, on the outer edges of town. Not the most dynamic and fashion orientated places, but it was it was a pleasant area. But anyway, again, similar to that moment when I was thinking about going into hairdressing, I gave it thought and I thought, yeah, you know what? Why not? Let's be on the outer edges of town. Let's do something different. Why do you have to be in the centre of town? So with the money that I got saved and a little bit of money from my nan as loaned to me, I, I bought in half into Mum Salon and yeah, it went from being a local salon. We turned it into a really exciting, thriving salon called La Hain Care Company at this time. And it grew and the clientele began to grow and, and, and we brought in a younger edge and we could see that we were really starting to get a good reputation within the, the county of where we lived. And, and, and yeah, very exciting time for me at this point in my career so we carried on doing this the reputation was going and I think we then got my brother then came into the business and and Darren was uh, very good at marketing business and we sort of decided look we wanted to open up a new salon and now this was around about 1999 and the men's market at this time was starting to get exciting grooming was becoming a big thing in men men's lifestyles and we we sort of seen the rise of the lad mags, you know, FHM loaded. Um, they were becoming big, and they were talking about grooming David Beckham and the rise of the football stars and music. And all these lot were, you know, showing that men were very interested in grooming. So we we found a, a, a property on the in, again in Northampton Town Centre. Opened it up. It was beautiful, all kitted out with beautiful high end barbering gear very very modern very contemporary at this time and we introduced wet shades facials we even had shower rooms there playstation a bar where guys could sit and we spent a lot of money and it was just it, it was so cool way way ahead of the time i mean we're now you know men's has become big now but this is this is like 1999 when we launched it so it was still very very new and i think probably looking back it was too new, too new for where we were in Northampton. I think it was more London, but it was still, you guys were still trying to get used to it. And I think trying to break that mould of men paying, you know, £7.50 for their traditional, you know, every three, four weeks haircut to suddenly paying, you know, think of seventeen, £20 was a big change for men. But it was exciting and we got huge amounts of coverage. You know, we were covered on TV at this time and we were on radio talking about it. And, and yeah, because it was different and, and I think people really understood that. But like lots of things in, in life, we make errors. And, and I think we made errors with getting that sell on. I think the location was wrong. Uh, we made, We spent too much money. I think in kitting it out, we, we got our business plan. So I think for any advice for anybody that's starting there, don't go off with the biggest budgets in mind. Start small. I mean, that was always going to be our original plan, but quite often things snowball and, and it got bigger and bigger and we spent more and more money. And in the end, it just wasn't viable. We we weren't making the money as we should have been. And we may, had to make the very tough decision of calling it a day. But at this time, we still got Lahane Hair Company going, really, really doing well. You know, I'm working in there three, four days a week then, working in the the men's salon uh, so we went back and at this time then friends of our family were looking to invest and and they kind of said well you know we'd be interested in investing in in yourself dominic and the salon and maybe expanding this so we took that opportunity so lahane hair company then grew we went upstairs became dominic lahane and it just took it to the next level you know we we introduced you know the whole life lifestyle experience into the salon you know we had the sunbeds and we had the beauty room separate color zone children's zone and we, we grew to the team i think in the end we had around about 16 staff so this very local salon that my mum started way back in 1980 had then become a really well respected salon and lifestyle salon so i was just so so achieved buzzed with what we had achieved here but there was now this point where i think we've been in the hairdressing the the, the salon life and I, I felt we'd started to take our salon um probably as far as we could and I think I was then looking for new areas and think about me. I've always loved events. Uh, I like to put on an event, 
bring people together and share an experience. You know, again, I mentioned it earlier, there was the British Hairdressing Awards, which I'm a huge fan of. I think they're, they're brilliant. I think they, they give so many opportunities for people to really launch their career in a massive way. But I started to identify, I was thinking, we need to think on a local level. We need local people to know about their local hairdressers. And, and if we could put them in limelight, then that would be only a great thing. So we done that. We launched our very first Northamptonshire Hairdressing Awards in 2004. I'd done it in, in partnership with the British Red Cross. And it was a big success. I mean, I'm so proud of what I achieved. And Again, so you know, you look back at things and you, you kind of, you don't appreciate them at that moment of time in your career. But looking back, yeah, I mean, I think, in, you know, this is probably before social media really was kicking off. I mean, you know, we're talking 2004. It was, I think, MySpace at this time. And, and I wasn't even on that at that point. But we we done it and we had a huge amount of entries. Lots of the leading salons in, in the area of, of Northampton got involved and Trevor Sorby, he came along and he judged and he was part of the whole sort of dinner and dance night. I mean, everybody was in black ties and we had the chief executive for the British Red Cross and it raised some really, really good money for uh, the British Red Cross. So we'd done that again the following year and it was again a massive success. I'd slightly gone in a different direction. I was thinking, you know, we, we can sort of bring in a PR company to sort of help it. And it was a success, but it was it took up so much time and as much as I wanted to continue with it 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 really needed seeing I think to to made that decision say you know what I'm going to go full time with this but I was still working in the salon and and our salon was doing really well very busy on the on the floor I'm sure you guys all understand what it's like to be a busy hairdresser so I just felt probably you know I might have to just give this one a little bit of a rest and return to this again at some point so that's what I did now it was the last time I'd done the hairdressing awards, but doing events and being part of events, it, it seemed clicked. And, and again, I, I really, as I said earlier, loved bringing people together and enjoyment. Now, another big passion of mine, and, and this is called growing up in the, the late 80s and through the early 90s, house music. I've always loved house music. I still do to this day. I can still do a two step. So if you ever see me at an open chair night, you know exactly what I mean. But I, I'm a big fan of club music. So I started to be a promoter. Uh, with a couple of buddies in the area and we we promoted our own club nights and they were called Velvet and they were wicked. They were really, is like a house night for uh, a grown-up crowd and, and they'd done really well. And I think we'd done about seven, eight of these. But it was during this point I, I went down to London, saw my brother, as I met quite often do. One of the things that I enjoy most in my life is meeting up with my brother and we walk along the, the, the South Bank and we talk about our ideas and, uh, you know, ambitions and bounce off each other. And I was talking to him about this and, you know, sort of come back to him. And I said, look, Dad, you know, I, I, I still, I love hairdressing. You know, I want to do what I do for club nights, but I want to do that for hairdressing, you know, in a way that we get a DJ for a club night, put them on. And we got talking and, and that was that light bulb moment where uh, Hair Club Live was born. And this was, I think, 2007 when this moment, and, you know, the word hair, obviously, as it says club I wanted this club mentality club like atmosphere live because I wanted live hairdressing so the whole idea was get a hairdresser promote them put on some educational events on local areas and and that's what we'll do and that's what we've done I I I then launched my very first hair club live night in 2008 where we brought Lee Stafford Stacey Broughton and B Dixon to again in Northampton at uh, a theatre within a school we had 400 of 50 people attend and again if it's a highlights you know when I talk of highlights in my career that was one of my highlights and to see everybody come away it went seamlessly well I was so nervous beforehand and you know this was a completely new thing that I'd done and but it, it, it was a fantastic success and but whilst doing this we're still working on the floor Dominic Lahane Salon really busy I'm still very much you know five days a week but it was getting to that point where I was thinking, I do need a new direction. Uh, I love this hair club live. I'd like, I think there's some real mileage to, to go with it. But working on the floor, 16 star, combining the times was, was different. So it was a massive decision, but we decided to sell the salon. And 
I moved then to a very small studio, very much in a, an industrial area, uh, completely off the nor- out of the norm. Uh, but it worked. It was just a base for me to go in and do my clients in that uh, studio space whilst continuing to grow the Hair Club Live brand. And now you've got to, again, remember 2007, 2008, Facebook had come on the scene and and. You know, that really helped starting to get the momentum. So in 2009, I launched my second Hair Club Live event, which was with Patrick Cameron. I went to the same venue, big sellout crowd again, really loved it, but was time consuming. I mean, putting on these, I cannot stress how hard work they are. When you're a one man team working with some great people through different areas. But, you know, I was a one man team putting these on. But I but it, I did have the help. I was working with colleges as well. So that gave me some great support. We got a lot of students along and they were great for college events. Again, we continued and, and then another college got in touch with me. They said, look, we'd like to put one on in our area. 2010, I then launched a, a new Hair Club Live night and that was called A Date with Lee Stafford. A big success once more, sellout crowds. But I was getting quite drained. I've got to be, be honest at this time, I'm starting to think mm, this is taking up a lot of time a lot of time for what you get back financially I had to readdress where I wanted to go but I didn't know where I really wanted to go with Hair Club Live I always knew that deep down I, there was always a burning desire of mine when I started out that I wanted to give a platform to young hairdressers that that was massively important to me so I had to rethink that and I then eventually met, met up with a colleague uh, Neil Long Brilliant photographer, uh, videographer, um, met with Neil, spoke to him about what I was looking to do. And at this time, I'd really started to launch Hair Club Live on Twitter. Yeah, I, I'm, I've got to say Twitter was really the turning point for Hair Club Live becoming the giant that it is today. It was there that I started to build up the reputation. And, and we created this this concept called The Young Guns, Hairdressing Young Guns. And I'm sure some of you listeners uh, will remember this and... If not, you can actually go and check out Hairdressing Young Guns on Vimeo, Hair Club Live uh, Vimeo. I'll put links in the after show notes. And this was where we get identify some of the exciting new names in British hairdressing. And we called them Hairdressing Young Guns. And this carried on. So me and Neil, we'd sat down talking over coffee and we said, look, I want to put some film bios together, maybe six of these hairdressers. And that's what we've done. And and we've done and we launched Hairdressing Young Guns, which included the names of Paul Watts, Kai Wilson, Eleanor Dean, Natala Maxwell, Casey Coleman and Ashley Hodges. And these are very, very cool films. So say you can go and check these out on Vimeo. I'll, I'll put the links in the after show notes for you so you can find them. And I'm going to bring some of these onto the show probably over the next sort of few months. And that'll be a really interesting show, I, I think, to sort of hear, you know, how they've sort of gone on in their career since 2013. But this really caught fire. And I think it caught the attention. And at the same time, we, we rebranded, we had a new website. And, and this website was a community site. So the whole idea of this is, I wanted to bring hairdressers together, network, talk, uh, and to start to build this community. And it took off and people started to upload their photos and we'd, you know, share their work on on Twitter, Facebook, and also Instagram has then come on the scene. You know, this is, you know, 2013. This And, and Instagram is starting to become a really good place for us to showcase our members' work. And it kept on growing and growing. And then eventually we we then had a, a message come in from LinkedIn and uh, it, it was Mike Vincent, who's a publisher at the, the amazingly beautiful magazine Tribute. And also had an email from Nikki Pope, who is the uh, editor of Tribute and also res- uh, runs Respect Hairdressing News. And they got in touch. They said, look, Don, we'd lo- love to meet with you and explore maybe, you know, is there a way we could maybe find a way of, you know, working together? So I went off, met up with Nikki and Mike in London. Really, really liked them right from the start. Shared the same vision there. Their passion and their, their, their love for the industry and presented in the right way came over to meet hugely in on that meeting and and we decided that then that was the right decision for hair club live to go off into its next journey and we formed a company rebranded hair club live a new logo and we rebranded it with what we call a virtual party and this was where we we went round to mike vincent's house in in kensington this was angelo seminara came along tim hartley Adam Reed was there and Jack Coward and and people via Twitter so would come in they'd, they'd be you know put, putting their questions in via Twitter feed or they'd phone in and speak to them and and that was where we launched it we launched a new logo 
And we could then see Hair Club Live was going, was starting to become quite a major force within British hairdressing and also starting to grow a little bit more overseas. So something that I hadn't spoken about yet, but is when we spoke about Hair Club Live and when we first launched it, the one event that I wanted to do was to give hairdressers a platform, whoever they, wherever they were, whatever level they were, I wanted them to get on stage and be able to showcase their work. And this was the birth of Open Chair Night. And we created our very first Open Chair Night, put that on in November 2014 to a pub, packed pub in London's King's Cross, Star of Kings. And again, in attendance that night, I, I hosted the night along with Tim Hartley, Adam Reed, Desmond Murray and Jack Howard. And it was a game changer. That, that was the words from Jack Howard, who is going to be coming on to our show very soon. And, and, and Jack... Um, yeah, he said it was a game chat, and it was. You knew when you were at an event, and you're thinking, this is something very exciting. Everybody loved it. We had, I think, 20 hairdressers that performed. And, and basically, the concept of hairdresser of open chair night is ha- every hairdresser has 10 minutes in a chair to shine, share, and inspire. They have no brief, no boundaries. It's freestyle hairdressing, live, raw, and, and unrehearsed. Set of traffic lights, keep time. So anyway, you can go and check out open chair night on Hair Club Live and it will give you all the insights in it. So it was a big success and on the back of that we then in 2015 went off on our first UK tour. Uh, five days spring went to Manchester, London, Birmingham, Southampton, anyway, all, all these venues around the UK had incredible time so exciting and i think everybody that was involved loved these nights and we had some brilliant hairdressers that got in the chair to showcase their head talents and the likes of andrew collins zoe irwin ken picton you know the guys at rush i mean it really was exciting and and on the back of that our 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 friends at uh, some of the hair manufacturers have supported the events right from the early start so to this date we continue to do our tours around the uk so if you are interested in performing in an open chair night the one thing is you just need to be a member of hairclublive.com and then you can be part of these events great platform for young hairdressers uh say so find out i'll leave all the information again in the show notes after so that's where we're at we, we, we launched a new website great amazing you know it's all about showcasing hairdressing so wherever you are It's your place to get noticed within the hairdressing industry. It's where you could get seen by editors, manufacturers, agencies, and of course your fellow hairdressers. So I can't recommend being part of Hair Club Live enough. It's the most exciting place going down in hairdressing. I know you're probably thinking, well, you're biased, Dominic. You know, you're one of the co-founders of of it. But truly is. It's something that I wanted when I was a young hairdresser. So that's where we're at right now i mean we've got lots going on with that and this podcast to what you're listening to is you know sync else which is going to run alongside hairclublive.com and how to cut it in the hairdressing industry is that resource so this is your place where we're gonna really start my, my whole vision is to take the hairdressing career and really repackage it and working with you guys the right people out there we want to start to make hairdressing become the exciting place that it should be because we all know it is a fantastic industry one of the most exciting industries that there is and i think so many people that work in it love it but we're not getting enough people coming into it and sooner or later someone has to do think about it and some of those problems i think are why are we getting enough people into hairdressing and barbering Probably barbering, actually, I think is having a rebirth. I think lots of people going into barbering at this time, but maybe not so much hairdressing. But I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that maybe the image for some people is just not good enough. And and in truth, I can understand what I say, because I think there are, unfortunately, too many people who, you know, maybe employers have become tired and not overly inspired by what they're doing and and that passes on to the staff and the staff become uninspired and they drop out the industry and and sometimes hairdressing has a reputation of being a bit of a dropout career well i haven't got my qualifications i'll go into hairdressing or barbering you don't hairdressing is a lot more than just cutting hair and this is that show i really want to give you the insights inspirations and information to take your hairdressing and barbering careers to that very next level so that's where we're at and whilst i'm doing all this i'm still continuing to work in my very small boutique salon in rural northamptonshire love the industry 
massive fan of, of everything that you can do within it. So what, what's going to be going on over the next sort of few weeks, months? We're going to be bringing the guests onto this. If there's a particular guest that you would like me to bring onto the show, then please do get in touch. Or maybe you're somebody that would like to bring Saint to the show. If that's you, again, get in touch. And how can you get in touch with me? Well, it's quite easy. You can drop me an email, which is dom at how to cut it in hairdressing.com. Drop me an email. Uh, let me know who you'd like me to speak to. If you found us sort of on iTunes, hopefully you're going to love this show. And for me to grow this show, your reviews and your your feedback would be so helpful to me. As I say, I am very new to this. I am going to be learning. And hopefully as time goes on, it's going to become better and better and better. So I'd love to get your feedback, your reviews. You can leave a comment on hairclublive.com just under the uh, the post. Uh, and also I have always the show notes. So by show notes, this is where I'll have all the resources to what you hear in the show a little bit more information about what you're going to hear in it uh, and a bit more about our guests and that's what you'll find going on there so finally so that's the welcome show this is the intro this is what how to cut it's all about and that's me as your host so what are we going to be bringing you well next week in our very first live interview i'm going to be bringing tom connell who's the artistic director of trevor sorby Tom's going to come onto the show and we're going to get an insight into Tom, his uh, career in hairdressing today and really hear on his rise from working as a stylist at Trevor Sorby to becoming an art team member to becoming an artistic director of probably one of the most respected names in world hairdressing today. I'm really excited, so do make sure you tune. Remember, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes and if you subscribe, you'll get the the updates straight away onto your phone as soon as they go live. I'm hoping to bring these probably to you and launching these every Monday or at least every two weeks. So Monday is, is the target. It may change a little bit. Yeah, look, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening today. And hopefully we're all going to grow on this. And, you know, if if this show does help to inspire you as a hairdresser, it takes you in new directions, I'd love to hear about it. Find out more on me. You can find me on Twitter, which is, uh, I, I believe I'm Dominic Lehane on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram, Dom Lehane. So Dom Lehane on Instagram, Dominic Lehane on Twitter. You can also find, I think we're going to, I'm, I'm going to launch a How to Cut It a Twitter feed as well, and that is just how to cut it if you want to find on that. So once more, thank you so much for giving me your ears today, listening in, and I cannot wait to bring you more shows and start to get to know you guys. So thank you once more. Have a brilliant day and look forward to talking to you again very soon. Daddy bye. How to cut it in the hairdressing industry podcast. Taking your hairdressing and barbering careers to the next level.